So what initiatives are you able uh, then to uh, pursue uh, in terms of the disabled in, in Ontario? Well, the lieutenant governor gets invited to countless speeches, hundreds and hundreds of speeches, uh, uh, speaking opportunities every year, and it can be from uh, service clubs to business executives to um, uh, small community centers. It, that reality has coincided with, or is overlapping, with the passage in 2005 in the province of Ontario of a comprehensive act that was supported by all members of the legislature, a nonpartisan support for an act called the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act, the AODA. And in fact, in the fall of 2005, I was asked by the then Minister of Community Social Services to be the first chair of her advisory council on the implementation of the act which is scoped to be enacted over a 20-year period. So it's a comprehensive mm. generational shift mm. in, in approach. Um, and so when the opportunity came as to, to be Lieutenant Governor, this act had mandated that different accessibility groups work with the local municipalities to form an official implementation advisory committee accessibility groups, different names but same function. And so when I've been traveling the province of Ontario and typically a civic reception is held by the mayor and members of council, it's also included meetings with the accessibility committee for that town hmm. and, uh, or city. And oftentimes, it, and usually involves uh, the elected officials as well. So it's a, it's a great way of getting the message out uh, to see what progress is being made. And so that's the number one uh, element. The number two element really is getting to the, the nub of the issue, and that is the unemployment rate for people with disabilities. I was just doing some research recently about the impact of the Great Depression in Canada, and that at its peak, at the worst, the lowest, uh, not the peak, but the, the worst moments of the, uh, of the Depression, Unemployment in Canada was 27 percent, mm. and that was considered to be the Great Depression. And fortunately, even in this downturn, we haven't come anywhere close to that. But for people with disabilities, uh, who are adults and who are looking for work, want to get it and can't get it, it's a perpetual Great Depression. It just doesn't end, because the unemployment rate, according to the ministry itself, for people with disabilities, is 57 percent. So if the Great Depression was 27 percent, mm. what does 57 percent of the uh, unemployment rate for people with disabilities, what is that, what words do you use to describe that? And I say it's, it is a perpetual depression. So why is that the case? And the pr presentation that I've been making as I've been going across the province is quite frankly, it comes down to a matter of attitude. It is difficult. Even for me, a person with a disability who uses long leg braces, who uses assistive, assistive devices, who um, has all sorts of friends and associates with a, a range of disabilities, it's hard to look at somebody who is badly disabled. It's much, much easier to look at somebody who is buff or is very attractive. We're, I think we're kind of hardwired that way. And so what I, I say to people is that when you meet somebody for the first time who happens to have a physical disability, or you meet somebody that you realize has a non-visible disability, there's something adrift. What do you see first? Do you see the disability or do you see the ability within? And we all like to say, oh no, 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 I see the ability. <laughs> and it's a nice answer, but it's not true. We all see the disability. There's nothing wrong with that. And that's what I tell the audiences. There's nothing wrong with it at all. As long as you don't let it form a value judgment about that person. Because if you do, then you've formed an attitude and you, you've made a judgment about that person. And, and people do make value judgments. They do. Uh, it is human nature and there's nothing wrong with it uh, as long as you don't let it then become a value judgment on the person. And so the example I use is to ask people to put themselves in the position of being asked by your boss to do a series of job interviews and there's an unusual set of restrictions in that you can only see the person from the waist down and you can't know their name and you can't ask certain things about them. So you're kind of, you're very limited in this. So 
if you rejected hiring the person who had an artificial leg, which you could see because you can only see from the waist down, you just missed hiring Terry Fox. If you did not hire the person in the wheelchair only because they were in a wheelchair, you just missed hiring Rick Hansen. If you missed hiring the lady in the racing wheelchair only because she was in a racing wheelchair, then you just missed hiring Canada's Athlete of the Year, Chantal Petitclair. And if you didn't hire the guy who's in the electric wheelchair and also needed a computer to speak on his behalf, then you just missed hiring the person considered to be the smartest person on the planet Earth, Dr. Stephen Hawking. And then you could go to your boss at the end of the day and try to explain <laughs> why you hadn't hired Terry Fox, Rick Hansen, Chantal Petitclair, or Dr. Stephen Hawking. Yeah. And then collect your own pink slip. <laughs> and, uh, in all probability. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, as you look to the future, these initiatives that you're taking, the awareness that you're raising, and you really are having great success raising awareness, uh, what, what should or could, or in a best case scenario, will it lead to? What, what, mm -hmm. what will the disabled 10 or 15 or 20 years from now in Ontario and perhaps the rest of Canada be able to do uh, and able to believe about themselves and their futures that they can't now? I think because of the physical changes that have been made and fought for very diligently over the last 20 or even 20, 30 years, in terms of uh, curb cuts and wheelchair parking spots and uh, automatic doors. That has had an, an, a profound impact and it's a, it's, there's a, a question a reporter asked me uh, a couple of weeks ago saying, why is this all happening now? And I, had, I thought, this is a very good question. Why is it happening now? And I, I think it's because as these physical changes have been made, People with disabilities have come out of their houses, come out of the, the group homes, and have started to be engaged with the rest of society. And so it's totally common to see electric scooters yeah. and people with walkers yeah. and people with wheelchairs right out there in the midst of everything. That combined with the Paralympic Games has given us that the, the flip side of, of that, the, the everyday person is out there, but it also, there are also amazing athletes who happen to have a range of disabilities. And when Ruth Ann and I were at the Beijing Paralympic Games, we certainly saw that firsthand. But you don't have to go to the Paralympic Games to see that. You can see it on, on the local level. So those two forces have been at work and continue to be at work. But there's still this unemployment problem. There's still this 57% unemployment rate for people with disabilities. Um, that can only change when employers look at their hiring processes differently. And that's where it really does come down to attitude. We're in tough economic times right now. They're not going to last. Uh, there will be better days ahead. And there is a labor shortage. And it's a labor shortage that, quite frankly, can only be made up by starting to look at that pool of talented people who have gone through the community colleges. Uh, the, the proportion of young people with disabilities who are in universities and community colleges, it, it's, it's higher. It's very, very significantly higher than in bygone days. They realize they have to get specific training if they're to get the job opportunities. And yet they're still going back to the community colleges a year and two years afterwards and to the universities a couple years after graduation saying, I can't get work. Mm -hmm. So it means that there's a disconnect somewhere. And it is at that point of hiring, which is why I have engaged in a pilot project with Rotary Clubs mm -hmm. in Southern Ontario to work with student leaders at the college and university level to act as mentors because the disabled students have told their own leaders and have said unequivocally in uh, surveys that the number one need they have is mentoring to get a job. Mm. By virtue of being disabled, they've had far fewer part-time job opportunities, far fewer, therefore, job interviews. And it sounds simple, and it is simple uh, on that level, but if you have not had the experience, then when you go for that first job interview, you might not be 
delivering the information that the person wants to, uh, the potential employer wants to hear. By the way, Rotary's a terrific partner. I yes. Mean, they've played a critical role in, now I don't know if polio has been totally annihilated, has it? It effectively has. Uh,